Hey everybody, welcome back. Let's talk more about strings. This video is really a follow-on to my previous video, which was a beginner video about strings in C. If you missed that one, I put a link in the description. I ended that last video with a homework assignment, a challenge to write a function in C that takes a string as an argument and reverses it, basically flips it around so that the first bytes are at the end and the last bytes are at the beginning. Basically, you're just reversing the text, and I encouraged you to try to find more than one way to do this. So how did it go? How many ways did you find to do it? Were you able to get it done? So why did I do it? Why did I even bother? It's because I wanted to talk with you about a topic that I think is vitally important if you want to become a great programmer, a great engineer, or just all around a smart person. And that topic is divergent thinking. So a lot of the students that I teach seem laser focused trying to figure out what the right answer is. They're so focused on what is the right answer. Dr. Sorber, what's the right way to do this? What's the best way to implement this data structure, this thing, this algorithm, whatever, what's the best way to solve this problem? But in this field, that can be problematic because there is rarely just one way to solve a problem. There's always a lot of different ways to solve a problem, and the right one for you depends a lot on your situation and what you care about right now. It may change from project to project. And that's the point. Divergent thinking is thinking that diverges. It takes you down multiple paths. It's basically forcing yourself to think about different ways to solve the same problem, different ways to get to answers to the same question. And this is really important for programmers and application designers and system designers because real life isn't a multiple choice exam. There's not always gonna be a right answer. And life doesn't present you with all the different options. You have to be able to find the options, figure out what they are, and then be able to figure out based on what you care about right now, you've gotta be able to see the right option for you. And so the ability to look at a problem and see all the options that are available to you, that's going to be critical in helping you make better decisions. So let's get into the code and let's see how this plays out. As promised, I wrote a function in C that reverses a string. I'm curious how many ways you came up with to solve this problem. I found eight and I included a ninth that a student submitted to me. Thanks Julian or Julien or how, I have no idea how to pronounce your name. Thanks for sending me your code. I think it highlighted just some interesting variation into the process, and so I included it. And I could have come up with even more options, but well, time, and I think this is enough to get the point across. So first of all, I wanna talk about some of the options that we have available. I didn't really specify exactly what your function needed to look like, so it could look like this. It could just take a string, return nothing, and reverse the whole string in place, meaning that it changes the original string into a reverse version of itself. This is a destructive reverse. It basically destroys the original string and all you have is the result. So writing it this way implies that I trust whoever calls this function to have null terminated the string and to have allocated enough memory for that string. I could also pass in a length explicitly. Now I can use the length instead of looking for a null character, so that can be useful in some cases. But I may also not want my original string to be destroyed. So I could also pass in a new array that will hold the reverse string when the function is done. So that'll leave my original just fine. Or another option is I could use malloc to allocate the new copy and then return that copy. And if you do it this way, your original array will be preserved as well. But remember that you need to free the memory when you're done with it. Unless of course you like memory leaks and you're okay with that. And these copying versions could take a length argument or not, depending on whether that's helpful to you or whether you just like extra arguments. Okay, so let's start out with implementation number zero. This is the first one that came to my mind. I find the length of the string, then I go from position zero to position length divided by two, and at each position I swap the character at that position with the mirror position on the other side. Note that I use a temporary variable here to save one of the characters, otherwise one of those characters is going to get destroyed during the swap. And I don't need to worry about the null terminating character in this case because I'm not changing the length of the string, so I'm just going to leave it where it is and we'll be fine. Now, you may also be wondering about even and odd lengths. My length divided by two actually takes care of this for me because if my length is even, say six, then it will go from zero to two and every character will be swapped. And if my length is an odd number, say seven, well now length divided by two is 3.5, but we're dealing with integers, so it's just three. So we still go from zero to two and swap those, but the middle character doesn't get swapped, which is exactly how we want it, so it works out nicely. So this example is fairly straightforward and it's easy to see what's going on and it works. Now the next candidate is here for comic relief and to make a point. I call it reverse zero A because it is functionally the same as the first one, it's just passed through a code obfuscator. But it still works. 
So why would anyone do that? Well, maybe I'm trying to make it more difficult for someone to tell what the code is doing. Maybe I'm trying to hide my logic so people don't steal my algorithm or steal my idea. Now, the bad news is that this only makes it a little harder to figure out, but it is a little harder, so maybe it's useful in certain circumstances. Our next real candidate is similar to the first. The algorithm is the same, but it tries to make the inside of the for loop simpler by adding an extra variable j. Now, variable i starts at the beginning, j starts at the last character, and they move together, swapping as we go. So same idea, we're still swapping, we're just, we have two variables and we're moving in towards the center. The loop terminates when they meet or cross in the middle. And now the upside of this one is that the inside of the loop is simpler. The downside is the loop itself, the loop conditions, the initializers, and the incrementation here at the end is more complicated. In fact, some of you may be so used to seeing for loops always look the same way, like this, that this one might be a bit scary. But it's really not that bad though. It's just initializing two variables. It still has one loop condition and it increments and decrements the two variables at the end. And I'm not really sure which one of these is better or worse, and that's not the point of this video. The point is divergent thinking. So for now, we're just gonna keep them both around. Our next candidate was submitted by Julian, or maybe Julian, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but thanks. It is a bit similar to the last one, the two variable for loop that is, and this one also works just fine, but it's different in that it doesn't change the original string. It copies the characters in reverse order from S1 to S2. It uses two variables, one at the end, one at the start, and the for loop goes the entire length of the string rather than only going halfway, and it copies instead of swapping. Also note, because we are copying from one array to the other, that we can't forget the null character at the end, like we have in some of the previous examples. With number three, we're back to reversing strings in place, and this one's for all you pointer lovers out there. Oh yeah. Two star-crossed pointers. One was the original string. You know it's already pointing to the start of the string. The other, we pointed to the last character. And then it's time to get close. So close. We increment one, we decrement one until they meet in the middle. Now all that pointer action might make some of you uncomfortable. If it's not your thing, that's totally cool. But some of you that love pointers, that might be a good option. And 3a down here is just the for loop version for those who prefer a little for loop to a while loop. I'm not here to judge, you do you my friends. Moving on to number four. Now number four is here for all of you who are saying, well, these options are different, but they're not that different. So let's change things up a bit and do it with recursion. Okay, so we're still reversing in place, but I'm gonna pass in the length argument because it's gonna help me with my recursive calls. Now, some of you haven't seen recursion before, that's okay. The idea is simple, it's a little mind bending at times, just give it time, it'll be okay. The main idea is that we have a function that is going to call itself one or more times in order to solve a problem. And this is a good solution for those of you that don't like loops. If loops just aren't your thing, maybe recursion is. So what we're gonna do is first check to see if the length is zero or one. If it is, then there's nothing to do. The string's already reversed, so return. So for all other cases, we know we have at least two elements in our string. So I'm just going to swap those two elements, the outside elements, just like we have in our other functions. And then I'm going to call this function, reverse four, on the inside part of the string. And that inside string will have two fewer characters. So we'll decrement the length by two. And then the process starts all over again. We check to see if the length is zero or one. It isn't. So we swap the outside characters and call reverse four on the inside rest of the string. And now it is only length one. So we know we're done and we return. Now, depending on how comfortable you are with recursion, right now you're somewhere between Ooh, that's nice, and it's okay, let it marinate, play around with it a little bit. I'll revisit recursion in some future videos. Don't worry, you'll get it figured out. Moving on to number five. This one is straightforward, it just returns a new string. We allocate it with malloc, and then I go through the array from start to end, copying the mirror position into the new array. We make sure a null terminate it and return the pointer. Just make sure that you free it later. And that is my biggest reservation with this style where we allocate inside the function and then rely on freeing to happen outside the function. It's just really easy for people to forget or just not really understand the rules of the game. They didn't allocate it, so they don't feel any responsibility for it, but otherwise it's perfectly fine, it will work. 
Moving on to number six. Number six is a hybrid. It's a solution for those of you who don't want to harm the original string, but you already have a perfectly good in-place reverse function like reverse three. So you simply malloc a new string, copy the original over, and then call reverse three or any of our other in-place reverse functions and return the new reverse string. So surely at this point you're thinking, we've exhausted all of our options. I guess I could change the order, take all the for loops that go front to back and go back to front or things like that, but that's not really a meaningful change and so I'm not gonna take the time to do that. But I do wanna show you one wacky version and that is reverse seven. Now, this is the reverse function that you pull out when you're at a programming theme party and it's your turn to entertain the crowd. Because really, this is probably not one that you would ever really want to use in practice. Intuitively, what this version does is just pick a random character in the front half of the string. If it and its mirror character haven't been put into position yet, then it swaps them and puts them in position. Then it picks another random character and does this all over again until it has put the right number of characters into position. So specifically, we get the length of the string, we allocate space for the new string, then we set all the characters in the new string to zero. That's very important because that's going to help us see when a character hasn't been reversed yet. Then we get the number of characters that we need to swap. And then each time through the loop, we first get a random index between zero and length divided by two minus one. Then we check to see if that character in the result is still zero, meaning that we haven't swapped it yet. And if it is, then we swap it and we decrement our left to swap counter. And we keep doing that over and over again until left to swap reaches zero. And then of course we null terminate the array. And at that point we're done. Now this code works, but it is slow. Maybe some of you could see that already, but think about it, especially as my string gets longer, because as you get close to the end of the process, you're going to find that most of the characters are already in position and you're gonna waste a lot of time trying to randomly pick the only one you have left to swap. But it's fun, and while you probably would never actually use this technique for reversing strings in an actual program you're writing, don't rule out randomization in your projects. Because randomization can sometimes provide some fairly simple solutions or approximate solutions to some otherwise really challenging problems. So it's a good tool to keep in your toolbox. Okay, so just to make sure that all this works, let's go down to main and actually run all these different versions we have. For the in-place examples, we'll just reverse new string and print it out and we'll do this again and again and we'll print it out and okay. For reverse two, we need another string. So we'll reverse it, print it out. And now let's keep going with more in-place reversals. Okay, now for the ones that return a copy, print them out, then free the pointer. And we'll do that for reverse six and reverse seven. Okay, that should be it. We compile it and we run it and it works. Lots of reversed and reversed reversed strings, which are just the original. And now you're all experts on reversing strings, but more importantly, I hope this helps you look differently at the code you write. I hope that from now on, when you're faced with a problem that you see many paths, that you actually take the time to think about all the different ways that you could solve this problem rather than just focusing on finding one single solution. If you can learn to think this way, it will make you a better problem solver and a better programmer. So thanks everyone for watching. Keep an eye out for my next video. If you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and click the bell if that's the kind of thing you're into. And until then, I'll see you later.